on this Veterans Day of 1961, on this day of remembrance, let us pray in the name of those who have fallen in this country's war, and most especially who have fallen in the First World War and in the Second World War, that there will be no veterans of any further war, not because all shall have perished, but because all shall have learned to live together in peace. And to the dead here, in this cemetery, we say they are the race. They are the race immortal, whose beams make broad the common light of day. Though time may dim, though death has barred their portal, these we salute, which nameless passed away. Much is at stake for the country, dubbed by many the land of freedom, the land of opportunity, the land of justice, the land of promise and peace. Two centuries ago, men dedicated a constitution for the land that earned us those titles. Whether it will remain so is in question. Before us is the task not to repeal laws or simply to institute new ones, but to regain the very character which made America, to restore its integrity, and to do so with the very same conviction that drew thousands of men to die for its preservation. In this week's Alpac in Action, I invite you to write the history deserving to the progeny of 2013 that the descendants of this age will read about our days, how the hours were dark and the chances of their future seemingly lost, but for the persistence of a few who remain defiant and dedicated to the enactment and reinstitution of laws which serve to secure the perpetuity of this nation's purpose. Mr. LaRouche, can the United States mold a new constructive strategy in the Middle and Near East by forging a more inclusive relationship with Iran, Russia, China, and India, and other states in the region? If so, will that be the end of the Sykes-Picot Agreement? What approach do you envision to achieve such a strategic arrangement? There is about one way, and only one way, that this could be pulled off. Uh, first of all, the, it, it can be done, but what has to be done, it has to start from the United States. And the United States has to put Glass-Steagall into place first. Putting, doing that first uh, creates the ba basis in the United States Glass-Steagall system for relating now other nations to the same thing as the Glass-Steagall system. In other words, without, without starting with a Glass-Steagall system, or the equivalent of a Glass-Steagall system, you could not possibly accomplish this. However, if the United States, which is a, a homeland of Glass-Steagall, the, starts the process, then the other nations will have vo very little difficulty in adapting themselves to almost an identical policy. And that, that's what will work. The fight for Glass-Steagall is about opening the way for the much-needed paradigm Without it, we face more than economic ruin, but the prospects of a new world war. Without Glass-Steagall, taxpayers remain the servants to the unpayable debts of J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and the other Wall Street banks that have waged war against America's economy since John F. Kennedy's death successfully, and which is the domestic source of corruption within Washington, D.C. This week... Efforts by LaRouche Pack gained more ground to refocus the post-shutdown environment within the D.C. Beltway with the introduction of a Glass-Steagall resolution into the Michigan State Senate. This is an excellent timing also. This is the outside the Beltway hitting, directly asserting leadership on inside the Beltway. The resolution was sponsored by a Democrat from Detroit, which is not an accident. 
He has seven co-sponsors as of now, uh, five at the time of, of filing, and another two have joined. Since those are uh, six of them Democrats and one, the Republican is from the leadership of the Republican uh, group in the, the state Senate. Resolution 98, sponsored by State Senator Burt Johnson, was made public October 23rd. It voiced acknowledgement that it is not acting alone, stating, Whereas, as of September 9, 2013, 18 states have filed resolutions demanding immediate action to return to Glass-Steagall. Maine and South Dakota have passed those resolutions through both houses of their legislatures. In the remaining states, legislative action is still pending. And, stating further, their purpose in so joining, that, whereas overwhelming pressure must be brought to bear on members of the U.S. House of Representatives and U.S. Senate to take action to pass this important legislation, now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate that we urge the Congress and the President of the United States to enact legislation that in order to prevent American taxpayers from being called upon to fund hundreds of billions of dollars to bail out financial institutions, would reinstate the separation of commercial and investment banking functions, in effect under the Glass-Steagall Act, prohibiting commercial banks and bank-holding companies from investing in stocks, from underwriting securities, or from investing in or acting as guarantors to derivative transactions. Michigan's intervention coincided with the Day of Action within Washington, D.C., by representatives of LaRouche Pack and activists from the state of Maryland. This was the first full week of legislative activity for the Congress since the three-week-long shutdown. LaRouche Pack members intersected a good number of House Democrats and Republicans with the message, Stop Obama's Wall Street War on America, Pass Glass-Steagall. Though a significant number of House reps were receptive, the objective is to go beyond agreement. It is to score for enactment of the law now. Without it, the United States will remain in the service of the Wall Street Gambling Casino. It means to service their debts, Social Security must be sacrificed, Medicare cut to the marrow, a chain CPI. But worst of all, an environment conducive for the full consequences of the Obamacare plan. While media outlets fostered the debate regarding glitches to the Obamacare website, making it difficult for thousands to register, if at all, the content of the so-called Affordable Care Act seemed to be swept under the rug. That the premise of its crafting was based on the idea that there are some lives not worthy of living. Peter Orzag, former OMB director, made it clear, and Obama intersected the notion using the example that it should be questioned whether it was worth giving his grandmother a hip replacement given that she was terminally ill, as published in his interview with New York Magazine on April 28, 2009. To this, EIR Magazine earlier in the week published a fact sheet exposing how Obamacare is threatening lives, not saving them, which was joined by a public press statement by Dr. Mark Shelley, practitioner of Port Allegheny, Pennsylvania, on October 24th. From my perspective as a family practitioner, and from my concern as a, as a citizen, and for my fellow man, I must speak out to explain the dangers that I see in the implementation of American health care today as exemplified by what is known as Obamacare. What I see being done today is chillingly consistent with the findings and warnings of Dr. Leo Alexander, Chief Consultant to the U.S. Prosecutors at the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal after World War II. In his article entitled Medical Science Under Dictatorship that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on July 14, 1949, Dr. Alexander made clear what happens to medicine when it, quote, becomes subordinated to the, guiding to the guiding philosophy of a dictatorship, unquote. That dictatorship today is money. Medicine and economics are joined at the hip. But in real economic, economic considerations and monetary considerations are not identical. The problem today 
is that monetary considerations take priority over all else, unfortunately including human life. The fact that health care is considered synonymous with the acquisition of health insurance today is indicative of this monetary slash health care problem. Nor is this a government versus private sector problem, nor is it a Republican versus Democratic Party question. We have just suffered a 16-day government shutdown that's al that almost precipitated a financial Armageddon, courtesy of President Obama and the Democratic and Republican Party leadership. I'd like to insert now part of what I see as a way to help with this problem. Um, when I diagnose a patient, I will take the facts from the, from the history, the facts from the, the, the physical exam. If a patient looks like they have cancer, I tell the patient, you might have cancer, but we're going to find out for sure exactly what the problem is, and then we will find out what the best treatment will be. If, and it doesn't matter if you smoked, it doesn't matter if you uh, did drugs, it didn't matter if you were born in the wrong, under the wrong sign. We're going to find out what the problem is, what exactly the problem is, and how best to fix it. But, and, and drop the blame. I mean, when, when I speak against Obamacare, I'm not speaking against Obama. I, we don't need more polarization. But we're over-polarized now. So, please understand, this is, there's nothing personal about this. This is about principle. And this is about knowing what's wrong and knowing how to fix it. So, Germany, under the dictatorship of Adolf Hitler, decreed to hospitals to decide for patients whether they were worthy of life or a cost burden to the state. America in that same time period didn't believe such a thing and cast the men who did to the shadows. In fact, it was America that instituted the Glass-Steagall Law as one of the necessary measures to relinquish such men from power. However, then Glass-Steagall represented the paradigm of a country that built the Tennessee Valley Authority, Boulder Dam, and other great projects whose benefits we still reap today. A successful reinstatement of the act is to bring forth that same paradigm. However, today we need more than dams. Our present society requires access to thermonuclear fusion technology. To understand how the harnessing of the plasma state will transform existing society as we know it, in terms of how we generate electrical power and how it will evolutionize the process of mining mineral resources. This paradigm, America cannot do alone. We will need to establish a new cooperation with Russia and China. Why? Because they are already doing it. Now, lastly, going over to Asia, where a different world is shaping, uh, is under being worked on, um, as Lynn said, as people are responding to what they see they know is an existential threat of thermonuclear war. We'll have some more details on it, but we have more coming out of um, uh, the Indian Prime Minister and uh, Singh and Putin after they met, issued a joint statement expressing their convergence on Syria, Iran, and Afghanistan. And Tanu points out that that is pro perhaps the first time that India and Russia have spoken out jointly on Iran but i think uh um, i think i find it very exciting that uh medvedev in his trip to china went to the province where um to haifa where the chinese university of science and technology is located wherein is uh, embedded its uh fusion facility at the institute for plasma physics and he visited the east tokamak um and accompanying him on the visit was Akhamedishin Velikov, who was the originator of the concept of the for of an international magnetic fusion experiment, which then became the ETAR project, um, and and other top uh, uh, Russian scientists. 
Uh, and he delivered a talk there to students and the faculty at the University of Science and Technology, uh, which he emphasized the long history of cooperation between Russia and China on in the area of science and technology. In addition to Russian Prime Minister Medvedev's visit to China's fusion facility at the Institute for Plasma Physics, there has been a growing drumbeat from Russia to renew calls for international cooperation of a strategic defense of Earth, namely, developing an international system to detect and deflect asteroids that may pose a threat. The renewed calls came as a result of the discovery of a 410 meters in diameter asteroid scheduled to fly by Earth in 2032. The discovery made by the Crimean Astrophysical Observatory in Ukraine at the time of detection had a 1 to 63,000 chance of colliding with Earth. NASA recently hiked the threat to 1 to 9,090 chance. Eurasia's pattern is to adopt policies that serve the interests of people, Nuclear technology and asteroid defense are vital to the perpetuity of the human species. Obamacare and budget cuts are not. We should reinstate Glass-Steagall to put the lords of the budget cutters out of business, that we may institute a new business, a business almost entirely forgotten for 50 years, a business that promises abundance and opportunity, dignified employment, and the elimination of poverty by offering the poor the opportunity to work. Where all seem lost, this is the story I wish for the descendants of our age to read in the books of 3013. A story written by the men and women of today, not by the pen, but by the content of their own hearts. By an age that abandoned the errors of their ways, and rather grew dedicated to restore the honor of the few men who founded this country on our behalf 200 years ago, that many languages called us the land of freedom, the land of opportunity, the land of indiscriminate justice, of promise, and of peace. Call the 1-800 number before your screen. Get involved. Almighty God, Bless eternally these honored dead who by their complete self-sacrifice burnished still more brightly the shield of personal freedom and the aura of human dignity. Let us who now enjoy the graces of their sacrifice bear heroically as they the mantle of our responsibilities. Give to us the grim determination the heroic strength of soul to spend ourselves and be spent that our nation, our way of life, our Western civilization may live. Amen.